today we begin a new series. We're going to be looking at the letter to the Ephesians. Now you may not know too many Ephesians, and so this will take a little bit of an introduction. But Ephesians lived in Ephesus, and this is an ancient city uh, in what is now modern-day Turkey, or Asia Minor is what it was called. So we've got this letter written by a man who believed it was his calling to bring the message of the Messiah, this, this work that's been done that we talked about on Easter, the work done through this one messianic figure, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, that God was doing something in Jesus that was shaped the whole world. It's something brand new is happening. In fact, God is uniting everything in Jesus Christ. So in the work of Jesus Christ, he is bringing everything together, heaven and earth. Uh, those who were insiders, religious insiders, the Jews who had the promises with those from the outside. God is making one, and he's making one church and they have one lord and and one body and so this this beautiful letter that we're going to explore is about how one is enough and it's all centered in jesus so i think we're going to have a very fun time but what happens is this church um, was formed out of a story and we want to look at the the life cycle of the church we want to look at how how this began. And then we actually have mentions from the other passages in the scriptures to know how things ended with that church. Not their final end, but we can see a bit from the launch to the legacy of this church. And I think you're going to find yourself in here. So um, just let's ask God to just open our hearts and just would you be um, ready to receive what he has to say today. I think you're going to really enjoy that. So we're going to just first look at the launch of the church, and that's found in Acts 19 and 20. Acts 19 and 20. So, um, yeah, why don't you go there in your Bibles? I'll, I'll be reading from mine. It's really pretty interesting. Paul, who we'll bring up more later, next week we'll talk about him in his introduction to the book of Ephesians. We'll talk about what he's up to and, and who he was and what's his backstory and how did he get involved in this, this whole process of bringing this message that everybody has got to pay attention to Jesus as the central figure of all of, of every society, of every family. He, Jesus, God, what God is doing in Jesus is the most important thing you could ever believe, you could ever imagine. And, and so how did he get started? We'll, we'll look at him a little bit later, but, but this is enough to know. He's on a missionary journey. And now Paul comes to Ephesus. It was the headquarters of, of all sorts of um, amazing and awful things. It was the, the head of an imperial cult. They had cult followings of past uh, Roman emperors. And when you put up, put up a temple to, uh, to a former emperor and they began this emperor worship, it happened more out of Rome than it did in uh, the city of Rome. But out there, you showed your pride. You showed you were a part of the Roman uh, system. You were, um, you were the, the best of the best. And they had two imperial temples. They had bath complexes with hot water, um, tepid water, cold plunge pools. Um, they had piped in water from aqueducts of all different sorts. They were living the comfortable life uh, for sure. This library was a private library. Um, it was also a tomb. And what it held was like 12,000 different scrolls. And these are all of the remains that they have put back together of this just amazing facility. So the rich lived in town. These are some condos they, they would live in. Uh, they, had, uh, they had so many amenities and so much beauty and architecture. Um, this, this is actually big homes became the center of how um, Christians got to meet because they met and they were excited about being a part of Rome. And they set up temples and say, hey, we're right at the center of it. We're awesome. Rome is awesome. And it's interesting that Paul would enter into a town like this to share the gospel. And, and let, me th let me think this through with you. Because a lot of times we think of the gospel as uh, the good news. Um, good things can happen if you just trust Jesus, right? I mean, we, we think of that sometimes. And, and, we, and you might say, well, isn't the gospel for poor people who need something? I mean, we're rich. We don't need anything. So why would we need the gospel? Paul would say, are you kidding me? 
Um, I think it's the rich that especially need to hear this. There's a new king in town. You with your terrace house and your your um, your merchants that that work for you, and you that are that are living um, living right at the top of society. You you need to know that your life has to change dramatically. So the gospel, this announcement that Jesus is king, that God has become king in Jesus and now is the center uniting everything is especially for those who have means because God wants his world back and he's taking it back in King Jesus. So you may find yourself in these stories today. You may be one of those um, people who are feeling, ah, I'm doing just fine. Um, but but you, you also may be one of those people who are reaching out today saying, oh God, I need something different. Jesus, would you meet my inner needs? Maybe I have what I need right now. I've got my stockpiles and, and I can last you know, through, through a, a few more weeks or months of quarantine, but, but my heart is just fractured. I don't even know who I am anymore. I can't, I'm having a hard time sitting with myself. You, you need to hear this message because it's a message of hope and grace and love for those who are open to what God is doing. But if you are opposed to what God is doing, he wants his world back and he wants the justice to be made. And we learned all about this on, on Easter. Um, but but the, the message of the gospel coming to Ephesus is repent don't, don't, they look around at all these other gods and the temples that were all over. There was a center of temple worship for, for the entire region. Everybody would come there because that's where the big cathedrals, you know, but they're temples. That's where the big buildings are where we come and worship. So, so he's re just requiring of them, repent and swear allegiance to Jesus and Jesus alone. You're, you're at odds with the king of the universe, and now he's making everything centered on Jesus. That's the message that he comes into this town. So let's take a look at the, the passages here. Um, he, the first thing he encounters, and maybe you identify with this, is some other disciples. They believed in John the Baptist. They, were, they believed in his message. Now, John the Baptist came to start uh, the movement of the kingdom of God movement and pointed everybody to Jesus said that's the one look Jesus he's the one but some people just stuck with John the Baptist and then heard of what other disciples had done of John the Baptist and so they just kind of they were like no we're disciples of John and so Paul encounters them and he said uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed and they said ah uh, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit not not sure what you're talking about. And he's like, whoa, well, into what were you baptized? Like, well, of course you're a disciple, so you're baptized. That's a big part of our movement. Get baptized, let's go. Um, but of course you're baptized. Um, so into what were you baptized? Well, into John's baptism. And Paul said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. They were, they were not the dirty dozen. They were, they were all cleaned up, but they, uh, they were not full of the Spirit. And, and if we know anything about the book of Acts, it's how the Spirit rolls out His presence and power and provision throughout the entire known world. I wonder... And this is a question for you at home. Do you basically believe that God did something in Jesus? Do you basically believe that, that yeah, if, if I had to choose, I would choose Jesus, but, but you don't have any power behind that? Are you like one of these disciples who's trying to clean up your act, but when it gets right down to it, um, you don't have the power of God? Would you ask Jesus right now, Jesus, I want to, I swear allegiance to you, you alone, you alone. Would you send your power and your presence? Because I need to feel it. Some of you feel so lonely and, and so unloved right now. But, but did you know that those who are in Christ, who have the Spirit, are full of His love? And at any moment, we can just say, God, would you fill me with your love? Spirit, reveal the Father's love to me. This is a practice I do every day. Just fill me with your love, Father. I want to know your love through the Spirit. Would you just reveal that in me? That's super important. Don't miss over that. So then the next thing he did is he came to a synagogue. 
And for three months, he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So he's teaching them something new has happened, and it's centered in Jesus. It's centered in Jesus. It tell, it's about his own story, which we'll look at next week, but, but it's, it's his um, bold persuasion. But some of them when, when, uh, became stubborn and continued in unbelief, and they started slandering the way. That was what Christians were called, the way. Uh, the, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. So early disciples were called the way, and they were slandering them. They were chosen to deliver the message, to bring the beauty of God um, into the world, to be the light of the world, and they said, nah, that's not my job. He pulled out of the synagogue and stopped after three months and took disciples with him. Okay, you believe, you believe, you believe, we're going to go learn. And they meet there daily. It says they would reason daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So both the chosen people, the, the, the Jewish people that God had brought the Messiah through and to everybody else, the Greeks, the Gentiles. So that's, that's the way that worked. And then there's some extraordinary events that I'm going to leave to you to read. Um, that's your, your homework assignment. Read the rest of, John, or of Acts 19. Um, but, but this town was full of magic power. It was full of imperial power. It was full of um, economic power. Um, the idolatry was really hot. Paul is recognized even by demonic spirits, evil spirits, that he is a representative of the one true God. When it was found out that Paul is the messenger of this gospel and people would come and try to get close to him and they were being healed of all sorts of diseases. Evil spirits were coming out and all that. So seven sons of this guy named Sceva um, were, were like, well, Let's go try this ourselves. So they go and try to cast out a demon um, out of this guy. And they say, we command you in the name of Paul, uh, or of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. So we get you, you get out of here. And the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them mastered them all and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And so everybody's finding out like, oh, something's really serious about this messenger and this message. And it says many, uh, the fear of, of God came, up, fear came on all of them and the name of the Lord was extolled. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And many of those who are now believers came confessing and saying, you know what? This is what I've been doing. I've been swearing allegiance to other things. I've been actually looking into magic. I've been trying to, to get spirits to talk to me. I've been trying to um, find out the future through divination, through, through praying at these idols and whatever. And they just said, I'm done with all that. A number who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So we've got these Jesus followers who are just exploring this idea of Jesus and learning the way and discovering that for two years. And then this loyalty to Jesus that was so white hot that they just said, whatever else has to get, in the, get out of the way, whatever is in the way. I don't care what it is, just get it out of my way. I want Jesus and Jesus alone. Is that where you're at? A white hot loyalty to Jesus that says, anything that's preventing the Spirit from doing this work in my life, from revealing His love, and for me living in His presence and power, I am done with it. Oh man, if you say that, God will take you on a journey inside. He's been doing that with me. Now, for months, there have been little things that he's like, hey, you should give that up. I'm like, no, that's totally within my rights. I can do that. It's no big deal. You should give that up. No, I think I'm going to. And he's like, wow, do you want my presence or do you want my power? And so I started to confess those things. I confessed to a friend yesterday and just said, hey, this is what's going on in my life. I need to come clean and get clean and just say, Jesus, I don't care if um, other people do this with a clean conscience. I've got to stop and here's what I'm doing. You know, and just white hot loyalty to Jesus, this love that just pours out. That's how this church launched, and it's amazing. But one thing that happened is it started a, uh, a process in the, the markets where people stopped going to these markets. This is the Tetragonus Agora. It's probably um, 
one football field square, so the length of the square, and it had stalls all around, so it was a straight up mall. In the center of this area, you would have um, people bringing in their carts, and in this, this city, it was so focused on idol worship and so focused on the temples of Artemis that a riot happened. So all the leaders of the market got together and said, we're losing business. These people, these Christians are so different. They're so white hot in their loyalty to Jesus this, this way that they're ruining our business. Now, here's, here's just this for you viewers at home. This is, an, this is just a freebie, okay? No extra charge for this. Is there anything about your buying habits? Is there anything about the way you live, the things you trust in, the things you purchase that make other people go, wow, we're going to lose our economy. These Christians are so different. Or have, or have you fallen into the mode of, well, I think basically I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow Jesus, but I, I don't want to be weird. I want to be like everybody else. I mean, I'll do, I'll do everything the, basically the same way everybody else does. I'll pursue money as my security so that I never have to feel afraid. I'll pursue this, I'll pursue that, but I'll also have Jesus. Is that? Yeah. The culture says, well, that's nothing. I'll just remove Jesus and have everything you've got. That's not how you start a church. That's not how you move a church. That's not how a church makes a splash in a community. Now, the splash that happened is pretty amazing. Um, so Demetrius, one of the silversmiths who, who made, um, uh, made business for the craftsmen, um, he says, men, you know that the, the, from the business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul is persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that the gods made with hands are not gods. These little things we hold in our hands, they're saying these aren't gods. And there's a danger that, 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 that we're going to lose our business. And so they actually pulled a riot together, a straight up riot. They moved down to this theater that could hold um, 20,000 people. And they brought him down to this, this theater and, and had this riot chanting, chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city's filled with confusion. And um, Paul is like, oh, let me go talk to him. And his friend's like, no, get back out of there. What are you talking about? You don't get to talk to them. That was how the effect of the church um, was, was played out in their community. They're, they're so different. They're not buying what we're buying. And maybe after this pandemic is over, you may not rush back to luxury items. You may look back to, you know what, I'm going to just buy things that help me provide for my neighbors in the future. I'm just going to purchase that. I'm not going to go back to spending everything lavishly and, and getting to the end of my, <laughs> end of my month um, and running out of paycheck before I get there. I'm going to actually live with margin. I'm not going to I'm not going to give my money to the creditors. I'm going to actually start to live with a little bit more wisdom and peace. I hope that we resettle in. Um, but if we, if we stop buying all these luxury goods and chasing after what the world chases after, it's going to cause a difference. Um, so we need to be the kind of people that are ready to say, oh, we trust in Jesus. We don't need anything else to make us comfortable. We just want Jesus. So that's the that's how this church started. And if you read in Acts chapter 20, um, that's your reading assignment. If we go here, we see in Revelation chapter 2 that there's a message of Jesus directly to the church. And he says, you've done good. I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and have found them to be false. In Acts 20, if you look, Paul, as he left the church after those um, two years, he said, be careful. There are going to be people that are going to come and tear you away from, from true doctrine. You need to be discerning. Be discerning. And then he says, uh, Jesus says to the church, you did it. You don't put up with those people. Um, you're you're patient, enduring patiently. You're bearing up for my namesake. You haven't grown weary, but I have this against you that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Whoa. You've abandoned the love you had at first. So he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. Do the works you did at first. If not, I'm going to remove your church from you. I want you to think about that. We're actually in, in times where, where many of you know we're at a point where we're liquidating this, this money market account and we're, we're um, trying to get loan forbearance and we're trying to do all this kind of stuff. Are, are we putting ourselves in a position that says, okay, God, 
we want to go back to our first love. We don't want this lampstand removed. We want to continue to be a light to the city of Issaquah. God, would you shape us and change us? This is super important for us at this moment. Yeah, they were discerning. Yeah, they had ferreted out the bad teachers and they had, they had gotten their doctrine so good. Way to go, way to go. But they had forgotten love of God and love of neighbor. The, the way that we actually express our love to God is by love of neighbor. And, and so they have forgotten the, the two sides of that greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This white-hot loyalty to Jesus had turned into, well, I mean, we got good doctrine and we're, we're basically, we're better than those people. And, and God says, I'm going to remove your lampstand. I'm going to remove the light that you are supposed to be shedding on a dark and disturbed world. I'm going to remove that unless you repent. So we've got to repent. Would you repent with me? Would you look at any known issues that you've got in your life and say, God, I just want you and you alone. This is the prayer Jesus prayed daily, constantly. Uh, was, Listen, Israel, hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh alone. You're to love Yahweh your God with your entire mind, with your entire being, and with your entire might, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is what he would pray all the time. And, and that, that is the, the essence of what we're trying to, to be. And at, at Issaquah Christian Church, we're just asking God to give us that white hot loyalty again that makes us look different to other people. And, and then we confess anywhere that that's not happening. And we just say, oh, I've been unforgiving. I've been a gossip. I've been a complainer. I have caused dissension. I have stolen. I, whatever it is, you get after it with Jesus and you confess. Um, in 1 John, uh, this is the first John is the first letter John wrote to, um, to believers in this entire region of Asia. He said, we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 5. We, we walk in the light. In him, is, there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, if we say, yep, truth is truth, I am, I am rebelling against God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Uh, John is trying to teach us how to walk in the light of the fire of God. He is passionate about this. And, and he says things like this, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride and possession is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. First John is all about um, living in love, living in the light. And as a church, um, whether you're a guest, a new viewer, um, a, a frequent attender, a member of the family of ICC, we've got to say to Jesus, just would you reshape us, remake us, renew us. Use this time uh, of isolation to, to put deeper roots in and burn us hotter than ever because we want to hear um, your voice again. So this is what we need to be asking. And th this is the, the, the final prayer. This is what Ephesus needed to ask. This is what you need to be asking God. Let's revive us again. And here is a four-step process to, to having a, a personal revival and a public revival. First of all, you reveal hidden sin. You come into the light. Search me, O God. Uh, ransack my heart and look for anything in there that is offensive to you because I don't want that in there. Reveal that and confess that to people. I do this frequently. Just confess it to them. This is what's going on. These are the hard thoughts I've had. This is my rebellion against God. And dump whatever's doubtful. Dump whatever is doubtful. Just get rid of it. If you're like, well, I don't know if God really thinks about it. If you don't really, just dump it. 
get rid of it so that God can move through you as a clean pathway so that he can be a, a, a hot and holy presence in your life again. So you reveal hidden sin, you dump what's doubtful, witness to Jesus, tell people about his goodness. He's worth having a life turned over to him. He is good, he is glorious, he is, he is kind, he is loving, he reveals the spirit to me. And then the fourth one, obey the spirit. Prompt, immediate obedience to the spirit. If he says, hey, send this note to this person, you just do it. If he says, hey, give this money to that person, you just do it. If he says, um, you need to give that thing up, you say, okay, done, drop it, what's next? This is a pattern that throughout revivals in history has been uh, the, the, the way it happens. Personal revival, reveal your hidden sin, dump whatever's doubtful. So the stuff that you've never confessed, you confess it. The stuff that's kind of doubtful, you just get rid of it. You talk about Jesus and talk about him alone, and then you obey the Spirit. If he says this, then you do this. If he says this, then you do that. This is the pathway. So I want to encourage you, church, um, to, to just pour out your hearts to Jesus. This is a process I'm doing. Um, I, I just encourage you, um, wherever you are in, in your home today, would you find a space and just do these four things um, and then continue them over and over and over. And we want to encourage you to connect with us. Um, you can go to our website. Um, the links are in uh, the comments below, so you, you won't have to look too far um, to, to give, to connect to care, to help um, the community, and for ways that you can get help in that way as well. And then right after this, um, I want to meet up with you. There's, there's going to be several people who are just going to meet up on Zoom. So the links are going to be in the comments for that as well. We will pray, discuss this message, talk about any questions that you've got, and we will um, pursue Jesus together. So church, I am excited to be going on this journey with you to be stepping into this new book of Ephesians, this letter. I pray that you would read it and that you would just let God burn white hot in you a loyalty to Jesus that, that makes the world say, what is going on? And I'll tell you what's going on. And you can say what's going on, that in Jesus, God is uniting everything in heaven and earth.